Pastor Stephanie. I am the co-pastor here at the Inspiration Church. Yes, I pastor along with my husband. It has been a joy and a pleasure to be the pastor of the Inspiration Church. And it is a joy and a pleasure that you would allow us to come into your home to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. As you begin to listen to the word of God, I pray that the Lord will meet you right where you are. Now, I want you to listen to the word that's already in progress. To ourselves that self um, if I don't have the latest this, if I don't have the latest that, then I'm nothing. And I, I, I'm guilty. I'm so guilty, y'all. I'm going to tell a story on myself. And, and this is a true story. This ain't one of them stories like mama talked about. This ain't the lie. This is the truth, y'all. Uh, just a few months ago, I think, it, well, maybe it was about a year ago, I uh, went to a baby shower in Lima, Ohio. And when I went to that baby shower in Lima, Ohio, I believed that our car was in the shop. And so I drove my dad's Jaguar to Lima. Now, I was so uh, excited about driving this car because, you know, people might see me <laughs> in Lima. So I drove the car to Lima, and when I got there, there was a classmate of mine that was at the baby shower. Okay, now, let me tell you, let me tell you how, how much of a stretch this is. Pastor and I drive a 2005 Santa Fe, okay? And I'm driving this Jaguar, okay, flossing and fronting. So I get in Lima, and, and y'all, okay, honestly, honestly, I wasn't really trying to be seen. I didn't, I even left the baby shower early so that nobody see me and question me about this car because I didn't want to have to, you know, tell them it's not my car. <laughs> so I left this baby shower, and didn't my friend from high school follow me out that door? And she looked at the car. Y'all, I mean, she was all up in the car. I, I was so, I was so fronting, y'all, that I had cleaned this car out before I left <laughs> in case somebody looked in it. Okay, so she looked all up in this car. She was like, ooh, Stephanie. Ooh, girl, that's what I'm talking about. I was like, yeah. <laughs> now, this is the, this is the I, I, like I told you, y'all, I didn't set out for that, but I was prepared for that. <laughs> and still to this day, her name is Kendra. Kendra, if you're watching, hey girl. Still to this day, Kendra thinks that I drive a Jaguar because, because it made me feel good for those people to think that I was successful by the standards of the world. Now, Paul, he wasn't like that at all. Paul wasn't running around driving in his dad's Jaguar. Paul was focused on what his goal is. He was focused on what he was supposed to do in life. He was focused all the way in, and he knew what road he was going down. Now, if you know what road you're going down, it will make it easier for you to figure out what to look at, okay? He knew what track he was going down. He knew what lane he was going down. He knew everything that he needed to know to focus in on the thing that God had called him to do. Not only did he know what road he was going down, not only was he focused in on the things that God called him to do, he also knew what team he was playing for. Now, in the Rio Olympics, y'all, you didn't have any doubt who played, who was, I'm going to just use my, my analogy, the running. You, you didn't have any doubt who was running for the United States of America. Why? Because they had on the USA uniform. So I never confused Brazil with the USA. I never confused the Bahamas with Italy. Why? Because they had the correct uniform on. If Allison Felix, or what's his name, Usain Bolt, would have put on another team's uniform, you would look at them mighty strange. You would say, you know what, Usain, what's going on with you? Why you got on the United States uniform? Not that we would be messed up because he had on the United States uniform because we would have got another goal. But the point is, is that he would not put on another team's uniform because he knew who he was running for, right? Now, why is it, y'all answer me this question when we leave, when y'all come get in my line and hug me today, y'all answer me this question, why is it that Christians act like we don't know whose team we're playing on? 
How come we act like we don't know what uniform that we need to put on? How come we don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, I got to put on the whole armor of God? Or I have to bear the fruit of the Spirit. How come when we wake up in the morning, Satan is saying they got on my jersey today? How come that happens in our lives? That, that just shouldn't happen. If you know whose team you're on, you have to know who you're serving. You have to know without a shadow of a doubt that his rules are the only rules. That his rules mean that we have victory. That his rules mean that we win. I will understand, but, but, but Jesus had a name for that. Jesus called that lukewarm. Jesus said that if you care more about your possessions, you care more about your money than you care about me, you're neither hot nor cold, and you're lukewarm. And then Jesus said, you know what? I wish you would be hot or cold. He said, yeah, I mean, that's a big, bold statement from Jesus. I wish you would be cold. I wish you would choose a team, in other words. I wish you would pick whose side you're going to be on today. I, I, I wish, but you know what? If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Or in other words, that makes Jesus sick to his stomach. It makes him want to throw up when he can't figure out whose team you're on. And Matthew, Matthew 7, 20, Jesus teaches us the same type of lesson when he tells us, you know what, you can even identify a tree by the fruit it bears. So, so in the same way, you can identify a person by how they act. So your uniform is your responsibility. Jesus does the changing. Jesus does the transforming. Jesus washes you with his blood. But your responsibility, say my responsibility, say it. My responsibility is to put on the uniform every day. I have to dress myself every day. I have to make sure that I'm ready to run this race. So after you've neglected some things, and after you thought about some things and you started focusing on some things, his last thing is that it's time to press. He said it is time to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. What, what, what did I tell you? What did I tell you he was pressing for? He was pressing to become just like Christ. He was pressing for that. Now, now, now y'all know at the beginning of the race, you got a whole bunch of energy, don't you? You ready to take off? You excited because you think that there's a possibility that you might win the race. But during the race, you might get a little bit tired. You might get a little bit winded. Things might happen to you. Somebody might come off into your lane. Somebody might knock you off course. Somebody might bump you off the track. But no matter what happens, we have to press on. We have to keep going. Now, by the time Paul told us to press on, let me tell you some of the things that Paul had gone through. Paul started preaching it, and I'm sure that Paul was excited when he started preaching the gospel because he was seeing so many people come to Christ. But then after that, Paul was stoned and left for dead. Paul was beaten with rods before he wrote, I press. Paul was whipped with 39 lashes five times. Jesus was whipped with 39 lashes one time. Paul was whipped with 39 lashes five times in his life, and he was attacked by an angry mob, and he received numerous death threats probably on a daily basis. So Paul was going through some stuff when he wrote to us that we need to learn how to press. As a matter of fact, Paul only lived two more years after he taught us how to press. And some of us came in here sick and hopeless and and we feel like we can't make it one more day and and our bodies are hurting and our backs are hurting and we feel broke down we, we broke in our wallets and we trying to figure out how we're gonna make ends meet and it seemed like our money just keep messing up and and we raised our children and now we're working on raising our grandchildren and and we just think that we hear a small voice that just keeps telling us you know what you might as well just give up just give up and stop this race right now, but the Bible gives us a story. The Bible tells us about a situation where there was a woman. And, and, and I, I, if you want to look at with me, it's in Mark 5. If you want to mark it in your Bible, Mark 5, um, starting at verse 25. The Bible says there was a certain 
woman. And, and, you know, a lot of the accounts in the Bible, everybody can identify with it. Only a certain amount of people can identify with these certain accounts. But everybody in the room today, I want you to listen to me. Everybody in the room can identify with this woman. The Bible says there was a certain woman. And the woman had a sickness. She was hemorrhaging for 12 long years. She, she hemorrhaged. She hemorrhaged and now she was bent over sick. And the Bible says that she had gone to every doctor that she could go to. The Bible says that, that basically those doctors had their way with her. They took all of her money knowing good and well that they did not have the remedy to her illness, but they continued to exploit her. They continued to take all of her money and this woman spent every dime she had to be sure that she would be well again. And not only was this woman physically sick, she was emotionally sick, she was socially sick, she was mentally sick because the, the condition that she had caused her to have to be separated from the rest of society. So nobody could touch her. Nobody could talk to her. Nobody could speak to her because she was an outcast and she had to be by herself. And I'm sure she said, you know what, I could take this pain if somebody cared about me. And I could make it through if somebody would just listen to my problems. And, and I could make it if somebody could just hold my hand over the finish line. If I had some support, some body to encourage me, I'm sure that I could make it. And if things weren't Bad enough, she was in isolation. If the sickness in her body was not bad enough, she was all by herself. But the Bible says she heard that Jesus was in the crowd. And I always get excited when I see in the Bible that somebody heard about Jesus because that means somebody was talking about the Savior. Somebody was lifting him up. Somebody was magnifying him. Somebody was glorifying him. And she knew that he was indeed a healer. And I believe that we should keep his name in our mouths. I believe that if we keep his name in our mouths, the city would be healed. I believe if we keep his name in our mouths, demons would have to flee out of this place. I believe that if we keep his name in our mouths, everything in our lives would work out for the best. So they kept his name in their mouths. And, and th the Bible says that the name of the Lord is our strong tower. I love it. And the righteous can run into it and be safe. Every time I say the name of the Lord, I know that I'm running into a place <laughs> that will keep me safe from every hurt, from every harm, from every demonic plot of the enemy, I know that I can run into his name. Well, after she heard his name and she knew he was passing by, the Bible said, she said, if I could just touch his clothes, I know I will be made well. Not only did she hear a word from the Lord, she spoke a word. She said, if I can just touch, if I can just touch his clothes, I know I'll be made whole. So just imagine Jesus. The Bible calls it in the press. <laughs> Jesus was in the press. The crowd was pressing up against Jesus. He was in the press. Can't you see this little weak woman no energy left, no money left, no friends around her, getting down on her hands and her knees, crawling through a crowd, taking the risk 
of somebody seeing her. I already told you that she wasn't allowed to be out in public. She was supposed to be locked up, isolated, all by herself, and somebody saw her. They had the right to kill her. They had the right to throw stones at her. But it didn't matter to her. She said, if I do this, I might die. But if I don't do this, I shall surely die. How many of you feel that in your spirit today? There's, there's sometimes I just got to press because I know I might die in the press. But if I don't do this, I will surely die. So she got down there and she reached. The Bible says that she pressed her way to Jesus. She pressed her way although she was tired. She pressed her way although she was weary. She pressed her way although she thought it was no hope left for her future. She pressed on anyway. And when she touched Jesus' clothes, Jesus stopped dead in his tracks. Because he felt the virtue, the healing virtue leave his body. And he asked the question, who touched me? And the disciples sarcastically looked at him and said, what do you mean, Jesus, who touched you? Who, who isn't touching you? Everybody is touching you. But Jesus said, no, this touch was a touch of faith. How many of you know today that this is relevant in your life? Because if you want to touch Jesus, if you want to touch him and move him to work on your behalf, you have to touch him with a touch of faith. You have to touch him with all the assurance in the world that if I get just but one touch, I will be healed. I will be made whole. Now, your press today may be coming up to the front of this church. Your press today may be, you know what, everybody's looking at me. I don't want everybody to know that I need Jesus. I, I've been at church for a long time. I've, I've been in the sanctuary every Sunday, but I still need him. Somebody might see me if I press. Somebody might see me if I reach out and touch Jesus. But how many of you know your life depends on this today? Your life depends on whether you will believe Jesus or not. If you will receive Jesus or not. Now, she said, he said, who touched me? And nobody said a word. And the reason she didn't say a word at first was because she was scared. She was scared that if I show my face, these people might take me out right here and now. But she made up her mind, it's worth it. It's worth me letting Jesus know who I am. It's worth me confessing with everything that I have that God, I need you. Save me. Save me, Jesus. So she showed herself to Jesus and she told Jesus her whole story. I want to encourage you today that when you come before Jesus, show him your full self. Tell him your whole story. Tell him everything that you've been through, everything you're going through, everything you're afraid of, everything you need to be confessing to the master. Now, after she told Jesus her whole story, Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now, wait a minute. Here go the shout. Here go the shout right here. At the beginning of the story, I said there was a certain woman. Nine verses down, she went from a woman to daughter. Just by having faith in Jesus. Just by believing in Jesus. Just by receiving the love of Jesus. And you can go from woman to daughter today. You can go from man to son today by really believing on Jesus. You can go from unsaved to saved. You can go from your condition to a new position in Christ. You can go from uncovenant to covenant today. From a nobody to a part of the body of Christ. If we receive 
our healing. If you don't get too tired that you can't make the press. If you don't fall out so that you cannot make the press. Now when you leave this room today, I want you to make sure that Jesus cries out from heaven, who touched me? I want him to say, who touched me? Who believes in me? Who receives me? Who will be mine today? Everybody stand on your feet. If you receive this word, stand on your feet. Give God a big shout. Give him a big praise. Hallelujah. Touch Jesus today. Touch him today. We don't have time to play games. We don't have time to act like he's not real. We don't have time to sit in the sanctuary and play pity pat with God, but we have to trust him and lift him up and worship him and believe in him. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are big and bad enough to do everything we wanted to do in the world. We were big and bad enough to be the highest person in the room. We were big and bad enough to be the drunkest person in the room. We were big and bad enough to be the first one on the dance floor when the DJ turned on the music. I want you to be big and bad enough today to press toward Jesus. I'm inviting you right now to leave where you're sitting and press. I'm inviting you right now to leave the state that you're in and press in his presence. I'm inviting you right now to come to Christ, to give your life to him and let him call you daughter. Let him call you son. And I know the spirit of God has moved you. I feel the spirit of God moving you. I want you to grab somebody's hand if you're scared to come down here on your own. If you think that you can't move on your own, if Satan is trying to hold you back, I don't care if you've been saved for years, I don't care if you think that you have everything all together, I want you to press in his presence if you feel like, you know what, this is my last hope. This is my last hope. This is my last hope. Now I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you. I want everybody in the room praying. I want everybody in the room praying. I see you. I see God's heart moving inside of you. And I see your fear and your trepidation. And, and, and I see you saying, they might judge me. They might see me. They might throw stones at me. Forget about all them and come. Forget about all them and come. I, I, I don't look like everybody else in the room. I don't act like everybody else in the room. I don't think like everybody else in the room. Forget that and come. 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 He's waiting on you, come. He's waiting on you, come. He's waiting on you, come. Now those of you like I said, that just need to press in a little further. I want you to come down here right now so I can pray for you. Don't wait. Come right now so I can pray for you. Don't wait. If you feel the Spirit of God moving you, don't you wait. You come down here right now so I can pray for you. I have a sneaky suspicion that there's more of you. I have a sneaky suspicion that more of you are pressing into His presence. I have a sneaky suspicion that more of you in the room no, you need a little bit more Jesus. No, you need a little bit more power. No, you need a little bit more understanding. No, you need a little more peace in your life. You know it. You know it. Don't let this opportunity pass you by trying to be cute or worried about what somebody else is thinking. They don't even matter. The only thing that matters is that you know Jesus and the power of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we, all of us, surrender to you. We surrender to your will and we surrender to your way. God, help us 
to understand you. Help us to love you. Help us to lift you. Help us to understand the word when we read it. Give us an understanding that you're always there, that you always love us, that you always give us peace, that you never make a mistake, that everything that the devil means for harm, that you turn it around and you use it for good. God, I bless you right now for every soul standing up here today that they are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves them so much. That they are more than they thought that they could ever be because they're your sons and that you're your daughters. God, we surrender our wills to you. And although we have to do it step by step, although we have to take small steps at a time, God, we surrender to you. God, we'll wake up every morning from this point on and put on your armor. God, we will take the responsibility that we need to take in order to be your real sons and daughters. God, we bless you right now that everybody in the room is seated in heavenly places. We thank you right now that everybody in the room receives a crown of righteousness. We thank you that everybody in the room is holy, sanctified, set apart, and set up to do your work. God, I ask you right now to anoint them, anoint their deeds, anoint their steps, order their thoughts so that they can lead everybody who doesn't know you into a relationship with you. God, we love you and we lift you up and we magnify you and we glorify you and we declare you are God and we declare you are King of Kings and we declare you are Lord of Lords and that you are high above every name and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God, your Father. It's in Christ Jesus' name I pray that everybody receives the blessing that is upon them, that they live beyond the curse that they understand that the curse is broken over their lives. There are no generational curses in this house. That every curse was broken on Calvary. We receive the blessing. In Jesus' name, we love you. Amen. Come on and put your hands together in his presence. I am so excited that you were able to hear the word today, but you could only hear half the message today and I want you to be able to hear the word in its entirety. So I just want to invite you out. Please come on out this Sunday at 11 a.m. to hear the word. Listen, if you haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father God, come into my life. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you raised your son Jesus from the dead. And because that, now I know I am saved. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I just want to welcome you into the body of Christ and tell you that we're glad that you decided to make Jesus the Lord of your life. God bless you.